So take your Bibles, turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, um, I'm going to be sharing the, the uh, message that I brought in my workshop yesterday. Now, <clears throat> I, know some of, I know what some of you are thinking. Boy, what a lazy pastor. <laughs> Don't say amen to that, okay? <laughs> but uh, I want you to know that... Um, I wasn't planning on doing this, that um, I had a message last night. You can ask my wife. I was working on my message and uh, had, it, had it loaded into the, the Dropbox, had the PowerPoint loaded into the Dropbox, and then just this morning before the Lord, I just really felt like um, he wanted me to bring this message to our church, and so I'm going to do that. Amen? So um, I'm going to talk about spirit-empowered leadership. And we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. For those of you who heard this yesterday, you're going to be doubly blessed today. That's all I can say. Not sure about that one, huh? Okay. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God." We're talking about spirit-empowered leadership. A.W. Tozer said, If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. In our modern church today, we, we have so many blessings. We have amazing facilities. We have media. We have... Uh, state-of-the-art technology, and, it, and it's all good, it's all good, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, none of that can bring about spiritual transformation. Peter and John, you'll remember in the book of Acts, they said to, to the lame man in their generation, they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as we have, we give unto you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I don't want us to be that church that has plenty of silver and plenty of gold, but no power to say to the broken and the lame of our generation, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. The greatest need of the church today, I believe, is spirit-empowered leaders. Zechariah 4.6 the prophet said, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen? Because listen, when you have spirit-empowered leaders, you will have spirit-led churches. When you have spirit-led churches, you will have spirit-filled people. When you have spirit-filled people, you can turn this world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen? But it all begins with spirit-empowered Leaders, And I'm not just talking about pastors. I'm talking about every level of leader, of director, of ministry worker, amen, in the church, right? Spirit empowerment. So what does it mean to be a spirit-empowered leader? So I'm going to look at what Paul says here in our text and draw out a couple of points here. First, he said this in verse 1. When I came to you, talking about the church at Corinth, when I came to you, church at Corinth. He said, I, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. So number one, spirit-empowered leaders do not trust in their own human giftings. Paul had wisdom, but it was not about his wisdom. Paul could preach, he could teach, he could speak all night long, right? But it's not about how well he could teach, preach, or speak. Paul did not trust in his own gifting. He relied on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, what we call the anointing. Everybody say the anointing. Because it is possible to be gifted without being anointed. Right? And we've all heard from time to time eloquent preaching with perfect syntax and homiletic excellence, right? But 
as well as the presentation is, it could be dry and stale and no anointing. And then someone gets up, no formal training, no three-point alliteration, but, well, but they're up there messing up their words, but the anointing of God is upon them. And as they're preaching, hearts are being pierced, people are responding, souls are getting saved, the altars are filling up, hallelujah, right? We've all heard singers who will, who will execute a song with, with, with excellence and with perfect pitch, and they have talent, and they have training, yet they have no anointing. And then you can hear the same song sung by someone who may not be a professional, but they come from the place of prayer, they come filled with the presence of God, saturated in the anointing, they may not have perfect pitch, but when they sing, the atmosphere is transformed, His glory fills the room, people stand in reverence, bow before the God, fall fall to their knees in worship. Why? Because the anointing of God makes the difference. And when it comes to leadership, when it comes to working in the kingdom of God, human ability is good. We need competence. Amen? Amen. Competence is essential. But these must never take precedent over the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach. Paul said, let my speech and my preaching be in the the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Peter said when men of old spoke, they spoke under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if Jesus needed the anointing, if Paul needed the anointing, if Peter and the prophets of old needed the anointing, how much more do we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our day and age? Because what God has called us to do cannot be done with human ability. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke. It is the anointing that pierces the hearts. It's the anointing that breaks through every line of Satan's resistance. And when you have this awareness as a leader, as a worker in the kingdom of God, when you have this awareness that it's not about human gifting, it's about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, it creates a desperation like Paul had a desperation here in the text. A des- everybody say desperation. A desperation. This is why, now jump to verse 3. This is why in verse 3 Paul said this, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. I was with you in weakness, fear, and much trembling, right? This is the second truth. Spirit-empowered leaders are desperate for God to move. Paul had a fear that we just read. And a lot of times we say, well, we shouldn't fear. But Paul said he had a fear. And his fear was simply this. As you read the context of of what we're we're focused on here, his fear is that he would minister without the power of the Holy Spirit upon him. I remember a time in my life sitting under the ministry of a leader who really had just had no anointing. Preaching was dry and stale and lifeless. There was no unction. There was no power of the Holy Spirit. I remember sitting there as a, as a, young, as a young leader, and my pr- I, I remembered, like it was yesterday, uttering this prayer in my, in my heart to God. God, never let me be content to operate without the anointing of the Holy Spirit on my life created a desperation in me. Charles Finney said this, the great sin of the church is not that we've lost the power of the Holy Spirit, but that we've become content to live without it. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, said this, my fear is not that our great movement known as the Methodists will eventually cease to exist or one day die from the earth, my fear is that our people will become content to live without the fire, the power, the supernatural element that makes us great. And understand something, there is no special formula for spirit-empowered leadership. There's no seven keys or or three steps, and if you simply do this, there's going to be unction for you. The, the, The 
The way to have spiritual empowerment in your life is simply this. The word of God, Jesus said, God said through the prophet, if you seek me, you will find me. Hallelujah. In Hebrews, I am a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. Amen. In James, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. You see, the God we serve is a God of response. Spirit-empowered leadership begins with a heart that hungers after God, seeking God in prayer. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, and they shall be filled. God responds to a hunger, to a desperation. Paul says, I was with you in weakness and fear and, and trembling because the worst thing that could happen to me is that I would stand before you without the unction of the Holy Spirit upon my life. Seeking God. In prayer, Jeremiah said, God said through Jeremiah, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of. James says, you have not because you ask not. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall, it'll, it'll be open to you. All throughout the book of Acts, we see this. It's when they prayed that things happen. It's when they prayed for Peter that the prison doors opened and Peter was able to walk out of prison. In Acts 4, it's when they prayed for boldness that the house where they were in started to shake. It's in Acts chapter 2 when they prayed for the Father's promise that that sound came from heaven like as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's prayer that moved the hand of God then and it's prayer that moves the hand of God today. Amen? Ian e. Bounds wrote this, What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations and novel methods, but men and women whom the Holy Ghost can use, men and women of prayer, men and women mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men and women. He does not come on machinery, but on men and women. He does not anoint plans, but men and women of prayer. Hallelujah! But today in our church, because we have, we have so many physical, tangible resources, we are so quick to rely on the arm of the flesh and the strength of man to attract a crowd. But those things, they do not produce spiritual transformation. We see it all the time. Churches turning to gimmicks. And, and performances, and the newest forms of media. Now, media is not bad. I'm not against media. We use media, but understand, media in and of itself cannot produce spiritual transformation in the lives of people. It may attract a crowd, but attracting a crowd is not our calling. Our calling is spiritual transformation, to win lost people to Christ, to carve pagans out of sin, to make disciples that will carry a cross, to raise up leaders who will become missionaries and take the gospel into the world. And that can only be done when the Spirit of God is cutting the hearts of human beings. Ezekiel twenty-two thirty, 30, God says, I sought for a man who would stand in the gap before me. This is what spirit-empowered leadership is all about, a man or a woman who prays. You cannot expect anointing or unction or spirit empowerment if you're not a person who knows how to get on their knees before God and cry out and cry out. But it's not just prayer. Go to verse 2 here. Verse 2, Paul wrote this. He said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I take that to mean this in our present day. Spirit-empowered leaders are committed to the Word of God. Now, how do you get that? Okay, well, understand something. In, in, in the first chapter of this letter from Paul to the Corinthians, Paul was addressing, addressing the Gnostic heretics who were coming in with their claims of spiritual knowledge and revelations and, and all this deep mystical knowledge so-called that they had, claiming that God had given them all of these revelations. And they were trying to impress everyone with their deep 
spirituality, right? And Paul is saying this. He's saying this. I have determined that I am not interested in anyone's personal revelations. I am not interested in anyone's mystical knowledge. He said, all I want to know and all you're going to hear about from me is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, what does that mean for us? I think that becomes very clear when we understand what the Gospel of John, chapter 1, says about Jesus. In John, chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who is the Word? Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We know that verse 14 says, Because the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. The Word is Jesus. So like Paul, our determination is not to know anything but Jesus, the Word of God. The Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God, right? Spirit-empowered leaders are not interested in human head knowledge. They're not interested in personal revelations. If it's not in the Word, we don't want to hear it. If it's not in the Word, we're not interested in it. If it's not coming from the Word, we're not impressed. That's what Paul's determination means to us. All Scripture, all Scripture, everybody say Scripture. Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now, we may not have the Gnostics of the first century with us today, But there are plenty of people in pulpits today preaching a humanistic gospel based on man's knowledge and not based on the word. Too many sermons today are circulating in mass that have hardly any word in it. Lots of personal revelations about what God showed me, right? A lot of motivational happy talk, a lot of half-sanctified psycho babble with a couple of, you know, pieces of scripture thrown in there to try and sanctify it. But I believe, I've said it before, you've heard it from me before, the four most important words that any preacher can utter are simply this, open your Bibles to. Amen? Hallelujah. Listen, if you're ever out listening to a preacher, you keep waiting for those four words. Come on, say it with me. Open your Bibles to, right? Too often, I'll sit there and I'll, and I'll hear preaching and it's like, you know, you get 15 minutes in, 20 minutes in, a half hour in, and there hasn't been any open your Bible too. It's been all humanistic happy talk and motivational speech. I didn't come to, get, to, to hear your happy talk. I, I came for the word of God. I need the word of God. I've determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, the word of God, him crucified. That's what I want to hear. That's what gives me life. That's what gives me hope. Hallelujah. That's what stirs me up. Preach the word. Exegete the word. No Jesus, no Jesus. I want the word of God. That's what Paul was saying. He's saying, you people at Corinth, you need to get rooted in Jesus Christ, the word of God. Stop following all these Gnostics and, and being impressed by all this spiritual knowledge. He's saying, get rooted in the Logos, the written word, the word of God, Jesus Christ. Get rooted in the word. Mission Church, we got to get rooted in the word. That's what spirit-empowered leadership is all about. Rooted in the Word. Read it. Study it. Memorize it. Amen? I had somebody in, in one of our doctrine classes the other day. It was, a great, it was a good question. It was a good question. They asked me, what do you do? You know, I've been reading the Word. I've been studying the Word. But what do you do when, when the Word starts to lose its freshness? What do you do when the Word just it doesn't excite you anymore? It doesn't appeal to you anymore. And it gets stale and boring, and you read it, and you start to fall asleep. And I say, it's okay. You'll wake up. Don't worry. It's okay. You can fall asleep. You get a little nap in, and then you wake up, and you read the Word. But sometimes it's not always about getting excited, amen? Let me ask you a question. How many of you here get excited about oatmeal? Okay. Got a couple people, a couple takers there. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I like oatmeal. I mean, pretty much every day I have a bowl of oatmeal with some raisins and some banana in it and a little protein powder. I'm pretty much every day. I mean, I like oatmeal, but I don't, I don't get excited about it. It's not like I wake up at 4 a.m. thinking, oh man, how much longer? Can't wait to get to that oatmeal, right? (laughs) I don't get excited about it. It doesn't really, you know, entertain me, but you know what? I get up and I eat it because I know my body needs it. Amen? 
I know my body needs it. I don't get excited about going to the gas station. Anybody get excited about going to the gas station? Especially $3.65, right? Look, I'm just the messenger, okay? Just like, <laughs> getting booed. <laughs> I haven't been booed in the pulpit in a long time. Wow, this is a tough crowd. No, we don't get excited about going to the gas station, right? But we, we know that we need to put gas in the engine, and if we don't have gas, we're going to run out, right? So we need to fill our tank. The Word of God is the gasoline in our tank. The Word of God is the oatmeal in our body. Amen? Amen. Right? Working out. I don't get excited about working out. Can't say that I love working out, right? Putting weights on, doing resistance training, core training, right? Cardio, getting on the treadmill, whatever. You know, I don't get excited about that stuff, right? Does anybody get excited about that stuff? No, you don't. Put your hand down. You do not. All right, Jane D'Ambrosio gets excited about working out. We'll give that one to her. All right. But I do it. We do it, right? Amen. Well, five of us anyway. I don't know. We do it. Why? Because we need it. We know that we want to be strong. We want to be healthy. I don't want to get winded walking up one flight of steps. Amen? Right? So I work out, so I try to stay in shape. I don't, it doesn't get me excited, but I do it because I need it, right? The Word of God is my spiritual fitness. The Word of God is, my, is the fuel in my gas tank. The Word of God is, is the oatmeal that keeps me strong. Amen? It's not about excitement, right? We read the Word daily. We study it. We commit it to memory because we know that our spiritual man needs to have it every day. Amen? So Paul's saying to the people at Corinth, he says, stop following after all these teachers who have all this humanistic knowledge and, and motivational happy talk. And he says, you've got to start hungering for your, your spiritual oatmeal. Come back to your spiritual oatmeal, the Word of God. Amen. Then he said this in verse 4. He said, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Not in persuasive words of human wisdom. Now, Paul had wisdom. And, and Paul, I mean, he, you know, he could preach. He had abilities, but he understood that his abilities were merely tools for God to use. They were merely tools for God to use. Think of it like an axe. You have an axe. It's a simple tool. It has two parts. It has a handle, and it has an axe head. The axe head is the cutting edge. The axe head is what makes impact. The axe head is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You and me, we're the wooden handle. Our abilities, our talents is the wooden handle that delivers the anointing to the target. Amen? Right? So your ability to sing, your ability to, to preach, to teach, to lead, whatever it is, whatever your talent, your ability, is simply an axe handle that delivers the cutting edge to its target. Amen? And if you don't have a cutting edge, then what are you? You're just a wooden axe hand handle trying to beat people into submission. How many hear what I'm saying? Right? How many have ever sat under <laughs> any ministries that were nothing more than wooden handles that had no cutting edge? That's what Paul understood. He said, I've got, a, I've, got, I've got an axe handle. I've got, you know, man, I, yeah, I've got persuasive words. I've got preaching. I've got wisdom. But none of that matters without the demonstration of the Spirit and the power. He says, I'm just a tool. I'm just a tool. Now, here's the thing. We understand that we're tools, but you've got to take care of the tool. You've got to take care of the tools. Tools must be maintained. A blade must be kept sharp. A vessel must be kept clean. 2 Timothy 2.20, Paul wrote this, but in a great house, there are vessels for honor and vessels for dishonor. If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Notice what it says. If he cleanses himself, he will be useful for the master. We have a responsibility to keep our vessels clean and full and useful for the master. They asked D.L. Moody, they said, why do you always say that you daily get filled with the Holy Spirit? And Moody said this. He said, simple, because I leak. I leak. Did anybody here leak? We all leak, right? We all leak. 
And we've got to be careful of those areas where we're vulnerable, where we have leaks, those areas where our vessel gets dirty, right? Those areas where, where our vessel starts to lose its ability for God to put the axe head, the, the axe head on it. Amen? And this is why we as spiritual workers in God's kingdom, we need to value character over anointing. Character over anointing. Can you say that? Character over anointing. Because with advancement and enlargement and greater anointing in the kingdom of God comes greater attacks, greater temptations, more intense warfare. Higher levels bring higher devils. Amen, right? Amen. And so we need to be committed to being vessels of honor for God. Amen. And I believe that as we're praying for spiritual empowerment and more anointing, we first need to pray, God, do not allow me to be anointed beyond what my character can support. Right? Lord, do not allow me to be promoted, to be enlarged beyond the capacity of my integrity to manage that. Because we have all seen where some leaders, because of their talent, their gifting, their anointing, right? They were promoted, they were enlarged. But because their character, their integrity, their humility was not deep enough, because of their gifting, they became top-heavy, right? Too much admiration, which turned to pride. Too much money, which, which, which turned to embezzlement, right? Too much attention from the opposite sex, which turned into sexual temptation and failure. They became top-heavy, and they fell, right? The issue was not how much anointing they had. The issue was how much character they lacked. So our prayer needs to be, God, do not allow me to be promoted. Stop me from being promoted, Lord. Stop the anointing from flowing in my life if I do not have enough humility and enough integrity and enough character and enough sense of purity and self-management to be able to manage the increase that comes with that. Because with higher levels come higher devils. Amen? Amen. 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 And then he said this in verse 5. He said that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What does this mean? The last point. Spirit-empowered leaders recognize their own insignificance. Insignificance. So Paul was saying, your faith, your relationship with, with God, should not be dependent on me and my wisdom or on any man. But your faith and your relationship with him must be dependent on his power and his sustaining grace. In other words, Paul was saying, don't look at me and don't look at any man. Don't look at those, those Gnostic heretics and those powerful personalities that are trying to put all the spotlight on themselves. Right? Because spirit-empowered leaders recognize their own insignificance, and they're always trying to push people away from themselves and to Jesus. Did you get that? Right? True leaders in the kingdom of God are always trying to push people away from themselves and to Jesus. In other words, if you're looking at me, you're looking in the wrong direction. Because one day I'm going to let you down. One day I'm going to offend you. And I'm going to fail you. Or I'm going to fall short of what your expectations is. And if your eyes are on me, you're going to get disappointed and discouraged and hurt. And you're going to run away from the church. And that's why there's so much, that one reason why there's so much church hurt in the body of Christ today is because church leaders are promoting themselves, putting themselves in the spotlight where people look at them and then the leader falls short and people get offended and they end up blaming the whole church and saying, well, the whole thing is, a, the whole thing is wrong. Where instead, we as, we as leaders need to be saying, look, I'm, I'm messed up, okay? If you're looking, if you're following after me, you're just going to get disappointed. You need to look at Jesus. Everybody say, look at Jesus. Right? It's about humility. Spirit-empowered leaders recognize their own insignificance. They don't put the attention on themselves. They don't want to elevate themselves. They don't want to promote a dependence from people on themselves. Instead, they promote a dependence on God. Hallelujah. They came to John the Baptist as people were leaving him and following Jesus, and they said, John, aren't you upset that people are leaving you and following Jesus? And what did John say? John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Amen. 
This is what spirit-empowered leadership is all about, pushing people to Jesus, connecting people to Jesus, bringing people to a place where if you as the leader, I as the leader were removed or fell or were incapacitated or God took, took us home where no one would miss a beat because they would understand that Jesus is the one who sustains them and his grace is the one who keeps them. And whatever happens to all the people around them, if they're the only person, only person who shows up, To worship the Lord, they're going to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. But some leaders want to set themselves up as the masters of someone's spiritual growth. You need me to bless you. You need me to guide you. You need me to help you hear from God, to feed you spiritually. But we do not want people's faith to be in the wisdom of men. We want it to be in what? The power of God. Amen? This is why we're always talking about you need to feed yourself. You need to be in the Word of God. You need to learn to hear from God. You need to have a a, a private altar area where you can pray and seek the Lord, right? It's not about Sunday morning. Sunday morning is great, but you've got to have a daily place where you're drawing near to God, where you're hearing from God. Hello? Amen, church? Yeah? Amen? Right? Don't, don't look to the man, the woman of God with the anointing. Now, look, I, I love the anointing. I love anointed preachers. I love anointed singers. I love anointed leaders. But we have become too enamored with anointing in the charismatic church. In Pentecostal churches, we love the anointing. We love spiritual gifts, right? And if you have a gift, you have anointing, man, we're going to make room for you. Proverbs 18, 16 says that if you have a gift, that gift will make room for you, right? And so if you're anointed, man, we'll give you a, we'll give you a place. We'll give you a pulpit. We'll let you sing. We'll put you, you on the team. But the problem is this. You can't get focused on the anointing because God has been known to anoint some pretty suspicious characters, Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Samson was anointed, but Samson was visiting harlots. Yet he still was anointed. Judas was anointed. He received power to heal the sick and cast out demons. He went out with the 70. Judas was anointed, but the Bible says the whole time he was stealing from the purse, he was the treasurer. Stealing the money. Wendy, can you imagine such a thing? (laughs) But yet he was anointed. Balaam, the prophet, was anointed, but he had Moab in his heart. Balaam's donkey was anointed, but he was a donkey. He wasn't spirit-filled. Anointing is not a validation of trustworthiness. It is just, all the anointing is, it's just God making a donkey preach. That's all it is. And be careful because there are a lot of anointed donkeys out there. You hear what I'm saying? Right? Tell somebody, watch out for the anointed donkeys. There's a lot of anointed Samson's and Judas's and Balaam's and Balaam's donkeys. They're all out there. Just because someone has an anointing does not mean that they are a spirit-filled, trustworthy person of godly character. How many are tracking with me? Amen. Let's stand together. This is why we need to balance our desire for anointing and spiritual empowerment with a commitment to character. Hallelujah. Amen. Mission Church, we need to be people of discernment in this day and age. Because there's a lot of gifting, there's a lot of anointing, there's a lot of people out there with impressive words and head knowledge, and we need to be people of the word. That's what Paul was saying to Corinth. He's saying, you need to be people of the word focused on Jesus, not focused on the Gnostic heretics that are running around trying to impress everybody. Amen. So, Father, help us, God. Help us, Father. We love the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God. We need spirit empowerment in our lives and on our leaders. But Lord, we first pray that before you give more anointing, that you will deepen character, that you will deepen our integrity, our humility, and make us trustworthy, Lord God. And Father, I want to pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be people of discernment, 
Come on, lift up a hand and say, yes, Lord, I need more discernment. Because, Lord, we recognize that there are some pretty suspicious anointings out there that you'll use people, that you'll use, you'll use anyone, Lord, at your disposal that will accomplish your purpose. But we need to know that just because you may be using someone in a moment doesn't mean that they are a person of trustworthy and noble character. So, Lord, give us discernment, Lord. Discernment, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we pray for our leaders, God. We pray for our leaders in our church, for our pastors, for our board members, our trustees. We pray for our deacons. We pray for all of our ministry leaders, that, Lord, we would be spirit-empowered leaders who serve your people. That's what we need, Lord God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon the mission church. Amen, church? Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord. And let's just show the Lord that we're hungry today. Can we do that? Let's just be hungry for the Lord. Just tell the Lord more, Lord. I want more of you. I want more of your presence in my life, God. I want more of your touch in my life, God. I want more of Jesus in my life. Lord, less of me and more of you, oh God. Fill me, Lord, to overflowing. Flood me, Lord, with your presence, God. Saturate me, inundate me, envelop me, and anoint me, God, with your spirit, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, I want to pray for those that that need to go as we close the service, Lord God, that we would go, Lord, with just a greater hunger in our heart for your presence, for your anointing on our lives. For those, Lord, that want to come forward for prayer, pray, God, that your presence would be here at this altar, that your power, your healing power, your strengthening grace would be here to sustain. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning into our service today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us. We pray that you're able to join us in person here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and 1045 every Sunday. We also have amazing children's programs here in the building of Sunday mornings for both services, as well Wednesday nights, seven o'clock here in the building, we've got amazing children's programs. And then Friday nights from seven to nine o'clock, we have our youth programs. If you wanna keep up to date with everything going on, please check out our social medias, as well as follow everything on our website at missionchurch.com. God bless you and we'll see you around.